Hello, everybody. Uh, we dusted off the cobwebs from Livestorm and are bringing operators back. Um, I'm excited today from what we've got in store uh, with Anthony over here. Um, Casey Armstrong, I'll be, I'll be hosting it today. As usual, I'm here in sunny Southern California. Anthony, where are you calling in from? Coming live from Queens, New York. There we go, from Queens. So if you guys wanna throw in where you're calling in from the chat, uh, we usually have some people from Chicago and, and overseas. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how my, my guesses are today. There we go. We got another person in New York. I'm, I'm outnumbered, so we got more West Coasters. Chime on in. Um, awesome. So we have we have Anthony here. We were catching up a bit before we jumped on. Um, he's got a great story. Um, he, uh, you know, his motto is you know not just a business with a product, but a brand with a purpose. And uh, Anthony, he launched uh, Rare Cut, and. Oh, there we go. We got Philip joining a, a, a little bit late, so right in fashion. Um, uh, we'll, we'll jump to you in a sec. Uh, anyways, he um, when he launched his brand, you know, he really wanted um, pocket squares that do not fall, so high and tight, which you can see uh, that he's sporting right now. Um, and so we're going to dive into his business as well. And we also have um, Phil, the CEO and founder of Arca. Uh, a custom packaging solution, which Anthony is going to be able to show off shortly as well. So thank you both for, for joining us. To start, Anthony, you know, what was the catalyst to start Rare Cut? Um, you know, and what inspired you to focus on pocket squares out of everything? Yeah, so never in a million years did I think I'd end up in the fashion space. Uh, if you'd ask like maybe some ex-girlfriends of mine years ago, they'd be like, this guy's a fashionista now, this guy was wearing the same three sweatshirts all winter and rotating them. Never in a million years did I think I'd end up in this space, but uh, basically what happened was, Casey, is I saw a problem repeated over and over again, and finally just kind of clicked in my mind of like, hey, this this is an issue. And what that, what that issue that I noticed was is, whether you're a groomsman or you were going to work, whatever the case may be, no guy that I came across knew how to fold these things, let alone get them to retain their shape. And every time they seemingly put them in their pocket, they would fall. So i had had conversations with people. I said, hey, like, you know, this fell, let me help you out. And everyone's like, I give up with these. I have no idea how to fold it, fold them. And again, this was never something I was looking to get into ever, but I happened to be at an event. I also saw medical devices. And at that event, my manager was getting uh, an award for manager of the year. He was like getting ready to go on stage. He's how's my hair, how's my tie? And he asked me if I could fix his pocket square. And at the time, this is like five years ago. I'm like, I really don't know what to do for you. And he's like, just try. So I did, I gave it to him. He put it in his pocket. He gave the speech standing ovation, but we got the pictures back from that event from his speech. And that pocket square was not in one picture. It wasn't, it, it basically fell immediately and it wasn't seen. So my rationale was, you know, why wear it if it can't be seen? So that's really what sparked the idea and just kind of was the first step or the catalyst, as you said, to going in this direction. I mean, I was gonna to ask too, you talked a bit about your, your prior career. So you were in um, medical device sales? Yes, and I still am actually, I still, I still juggle both. So um, yeah, it's, so, so basically one helps really fund uh, rare cut just to kind of do the two for as long as I can. Yeah, and I was gonna ask, cause you know, in New York, I know the, the finance scene is, is rather large and people dress up a bit more there than they do in California where I am, or uh, you know, Phil's got his Austin attire on. Um, so a little bit more low key. Um, so another uh, thing that uh, was you know exciting, you I know you've been at work on it for a while. You launched your Kickstarter. You hit your initial goal within ten minutes, which is just insane. And I believe you sold like fifty thousand units uh, within like the first thirty days. So ten minutes, you know, this overnight success that you've been working on for years. Tell us about the build up and how you were able to achieve that success early on. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So as I mentioned at that point, I came up with the concept pr four years prior. And I would say the number of delayed launches we had was, was something else. I think we had three or four delayed launches and just weren't ready yet. We needed to improve certain things. And when you're doing this for the first time, um, or launching any business for the first time, you don't really know what's in store for you. You can read all the books, listen to all the podcasts, watch every episode of Shark Tank. And does that stuff help to a degree? Absolutely. But nothing quite prepares you for getting into your own business 
aside from starting your own business. It's really the only way to learn. And I would miscalculate things or I would underestimate, overestimate uh, shipping times or maybe getting certain supplies or production. So I, like I said, I delayed about three or four times and our next, the big launch was supposed to be in March of 2020. Well, earlier that month, we all, the whole world learned what coronavirus was. So that pushed it back to September. And I remember thinking, Casey, I was like, is it appropriate or is it the right time to launch a fashion accessories brand in the middle of the pandemic when the founder himself is rocking sweats every single day at this point? But at that point, I was like, you know what? Let me test this as a proof of concept. Let me just see if, if we're onto something here. And as you mentioned, uh, I was pleasantly surprised and uh, humbled by launching this, like I said, September 2020, and then within 10 minutes or so, we hit our minimum funding goal. So we did over $10,000 in, in about 10 minutes. So that was just one of those things where I was like, should I do it? And then you do it. And honestly, it was one of the, the probably the highest I've ever felt. Like so that's a beautiful natural high of just like, you know what, all that work, all that, that kind of self doubt, all the delays all brought me to here and I went for it. And you just feel like, all right, we've arrived. So it was a really big moment for the company and for, for myself personally. That's amazing. Did you have like a, a you know, an email list and Facebook groups? Like how, how are you getting a lot of the word out? Were you seeing people share it a lot, like with their friends, you know, where was a lot of the pickup coming from? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically for four years, ever since I came up with the concept in my mind, before I had anything tangible, I would just ask people their opinion, like, hey, do you think this is a cool name? Or what do you, you know, what do you feel, what do you think about this prototype? I would go on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and I'd ask people, okay, I'm, I'm choosing between two patterns. Which of these do you happen to like more? And really any conversation I had with people, either they would bring it up or somehow I would bring it up. So by the time I was ready to launch, I reached out to pretty much everyone I know in my entire network and I said, hey, remember that idea I told you about like two years ago, three years ago about rare cut? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I go, well, we're actually launching next week. And I go, is it cool if I like send you a calendar invite? Um, and if you know, if you're open to supporting it, um, it's gonna be at this time. I would tell I, every single person with the exception of one person, but that, we're not <laughs> gonna get into that. Every person said yes, literally every person. Now not every single person supported it, but every person was like, yeah, absolutely. Let me know. And once we went live, the reason that we got to 10 K so quickly was because of doing that groundwork and having had those conversations for many years. So you'd mentioned overnight success and we hear that a lot, but it took, a, it took years of, of, of conversation and promoting and just getting other people's opinions to get to that point. And for as much as you can share, cause I know you have your, like, you know, your proprietary blend or te technology, like what was, you know, what were some of the hardest learnings to find what would actually work here and, and how do you go through that iteration process? That was very difficult. So we went through three different engineers, um, two mechanical engineers, one tactile engineer, which I didn't even know was a thing. Um, and ultimately everyone kind of helped get it a little closer to where it should be like a little closer, a little closer. Um, and when you first get something like when you're trying to invent something that doesn't exist and there's a patent pending on this right now, uh, the first version of anything, you're like, whoa, this is incredible. I look back and I'm like, oh my God, was I at that point, I was actually ready to launch with this thing. Like you, it was so rigid and I felt like it was going to break if you tried to bend it. But there's a quote that says, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. And I kind of always kept that in mind. Now, I never wanted to launch anything I would be embarrassed of. Like, well, I shouldn't say embarrassed is the quote, but like ashamed of rather. But I knew that as time went on, I would gradually improve it. So I, at some point I was like, you know what? Let's go, let's test the proof of concept. Maybe there's no need for this, but you never know unless you put it out there. So the person that actually helped me really kind of figure it out was not an engineer at all. He worked in the fashion district in New York City. And he's like, Ah, this could be a little softer. This this material could be a little bit better. And ultimately what we stumbled upon and, and a lot of it was sheer luck, to be honest with you, uh, was something that we're very happy with. And just to show you how it kind of works is we have a memory metal in here. So no matter how you bend 
twist or fold it, it retains its shape. And when you put it in your pocket, and as our tagline is, it stays up. So as promised, you shape it any way you want. And when you put it in your pocket, it stays there. You don't have to worry about it falling or, you know, coming undone. So just one of those things that it just makes something that's currently existing and we just improved it. And that, that was kind of the goal the whole time. And now we don't want to just have, like I mentioned to you earlier, I don't want to just have a product company with a product that doesn't quite interest me. I want to be a brand uh, with a purpose. And that's the direction that we're evolving and gravitating towards. That's, that's great. And I, I like, I like the, I always like the live demos. I think you mentioned earlier, um, you know, if, if you're not embarrassed by what you launched, you know, first, then, you know, you're not moving fast enough or, or not growing. I remember, gosh, this was years ago. Now I actually launched a, a co-working space here in, in Southern California. The demand was, was not high. We did it. We, we just got great terms and I soon found out why it was like above a subway. It just reeked of like subway bread all the time. Wow. Um, people needed like a place to work and we built kind of a cool environment before I just leased it all out to one company but looking back and like the paint we used and just it it reeked <laughs> suboptimal fast and i know with ship bob um you know the, the early days like you know the founders would literally wear like a to go with the term ship like a sailor's cap and actually go to people's houses and like actually pick up their stuff and then like go drive it out and so you just think you know, from from that idea of wearing a sailor's hat, actually going to customer houses to you know almost thirty fulfillment centers around the globe, it it can change quickly. Phil, any early horror stories you want to share with us into the evolution that is now Arca? I mean, yeah, starting out uh, the company, uh, you know, moving back with your parents to start your company and having them cry into your engineering degree as you start to. Uh, get something off the ground, um, you know, child of immigrant parents, having them come all this way just to see you quit a job at, you know, a Fortune 500 defense contractor like Boeing with the most like cushy job imaginable to, you know, take that, just completely throw it in the trash and start from something from scratch. That's, that's like the beginning of the horror story that, that is, um, you know, the origins of ARCA. But I feel like a lot of people go through it um in terms of um may maybe it's a people of color thing that's a little bit more uh, shrewd on the parental side because they have this like feeling of safety uh when they immigrate to a new company or a new country and they want you to take the safe route because they just you know went through all that to get you to where you are um and it's almost like a disrespectful thing to do to just completely throw that to the wayside until you um until you get to a place where you can show that hey you can stand on your own two feet this is actually a pretty great idea um but no it's it's been a great it's been a great uh, trip so far for sure yeah the, the early days are, are always tough and yeah you leave a, a nice job at boeing which is a you know a globally known company that uh i, I could see some some interesting conversations so we're gonna get the films back with some some things on arca um well, anthony you know before I jump into how, you know, your network of manufacturers and, and how you split that up, what's the, uh, the pocket square you're sporting today and uh, which, one's, which one's your favorite? I've got the website open right now. So I'm actually, my favorite happens to be the one I'm rocking right now. So uh, my background is, is Greek, second generation Greek American. And uh, typically a lot of people in the Greek culture gravitate towards something called the mati or the evil eye. So being that, especially in the beginning, you have to know, you have to find your first 1,000 true fans, right? That they say is the foundation of starting any successful business, is speaking to your audience and kind of knowing, you know, who are the people that are watching, who are the people that are supporting you? Well, in my case, being that we're a startup and we're, you know, just about one year old, really, um, a lot of my customers happen to be people that, from the community, people that I know, friends of friends, and a lot of them are Greek. So I got asked, do you have any Greek theme patterns? a year ago and we didn't so i was like wow let me get moving on that and this has become our most popular pattern it's uh it's the evil eye pattern so i actually had um an artist that i know put this together and it matches just about anything so that's that's kind of my go-to is my favorite and one thing i'll say is um you know if you're especially uh, if you're going out and just making small talk conversation it's just one of those things which i like about pocket squares it's just like 
if maybe there's nothing to say in the conversation or it's a good conversation starter, like, oh, is that the evil eye? And it's, especially as a single guy, which I am right now, it's a very good conversation starter and just kind of like is, is a great icebreaker as well. So. Do you have the Athens key? I'm sorry? Do you have the Athens key pattern for any of them? Ooh, no, but I'm actually, I have a little notepad and I'm about to write that down. I like that as well. That would be beautiful. No, I like that also, man. Thank you. Yep. Joel wants his cut though on each sale. So there you go. <laughs> no, I want him to just continue succeeding because he'll just get boxes from us. His success is our exactly. success. Exactly. No cut, just keep going. <laughs> I like that. There we go. So um, you 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 work with so perfect segue. You work with you know uh, I believe local artists maybe to to source some of the design. How do you go about that route? And then also. Um, I believe you use our network of manufacturers versus a single source. If you can just share a little bit there and, and how you kind of juggle between, you know, the, from quality, reliability, and, um, you know, spreading out some of the risks of the business. Sure. So, um, yeah, first and foremost, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is I didn't want to, I never got into this just to have a, a product and just a company that, I can just stick with my medical device job and have that have those buckets filled um, and have free time if that's really what I was after. But that's not the end goal. The end goal is to have, like I mentioned, a brand with a purpose. So one thing that I did was during uh, really the peak of the pandemic, right after we launched, I unfortunately, especially in New York City, I know this is true for many cities around the world, uh, but I was seeing a lot of friends who had businesses, family owned businesses, and they were shutting down after 30 years, 40 years of being open. And it really was like, it was heartbreaking to watch that. And I wanted to get involved. I wanted to help to some degree. Uh, I saw what Barstool Fund was doing. I, I loved it um, in, you know, just raising money for small businesses. And one thing that I wanted to do was I said, I want to get involved. I want to do something. I just don't know how to tie in the two. But I think that's kind of the magic of being a startup and having your own company is you make the rules. You can do whatever you'd like. And I was like, you know what? We're going to tie this in somehow. So what I did was, is I actually created a shop local pattern. So we took that classic New York City cup. We put shop local in the middle. And at the top, we put the, um, the torch from the Statue of Liberty. So I'll just show it to you here. And what I did was I featured local business owners. And what we did was we featured their stories. And I thought it was very important to give people insight into what goes on for someone that is trying to make it during a really tough time where there's no, there's no rule book. There's no, there's really nothing to fall back on and, and compare to this time, you know, it's unprecedented. So what we did was, was we wanted to feature individuals and families that run a business because there is a quote, it's a weird person to quote, but the quote itself is actually good, especially if you like history. So the quote is, the death of one person is a tragedy, but the death of a million people is, is, is a statistic. And again, it's from Stalin, not a good dude, but the quote actually has a lot of truth to it in that when we hear so many people are losing their jobs, we almost become numb to it. It's like, oh, X amount of thousand businesses closed in New York City. Oh, what do you know? It's just a number. But when you see that person that every day is busting their butt, going to work, trying to keep their doors open, now all of a sudden we're invested, we care. And that's what I wanted to do was show the people, the individuals that are out there busting their butts, trying to, you know, raise money for their family, trying to keep their business open. So we did that and we donated a portion of the proceeds to the Barstool Fund. And we also made shirts as well. So now we're like, all right, we're evolving. We're a new company, but we're evolving into kind of a lifestyle brand. Uh, secondly, we also did that with breast cancer awareness. You know, everyone to some degree, uh, has been affected uh, or know someone that was affected by you know breast cancer and i wanted to uh, do the same thing we did with shop local with uh, the avon foundation so we featured women that either themselves or their families or their mothers or aunts somebody went through it kind of shared a little insight of like hey this is the experience this is what i went through this is what you can expect and i would say if anything we've done in the past year um we had so many nice messages from people being like, Hey, I'm getting my first mammogram because I've seen all these posts and I never thought like a girl that's 27, 28 years old can get breast cancer. So I'm telling my sisters to, we're all getting mammograms together and things like that. And that's when you actually feel like you're, you're, you're giving, you're serving a higher purpose. You're not just 
this faceless company that just, hey, take this product. That's again, that's not my intention. So we did our own thing. And what we did was we put a spin on the ribbon. So it's actually in the packaging here. But um, we basically have two hands that are holding one another. So the women that go through it and their families, friends that help them up during this journey. And honestly, it was one of our most successful campaigns that we ran. And that just kind of opened my eyes to wanting to do a whole lot more of this. So again, we're a brand new company, but I already know where my vision is and, and where the future is for this company. And that's telling real stories of real people and, and setting up different uh, causes that are near and dear to my hearts and to others and just bringing awareness to them. That's amazing. And I mean, COVID was so tough on so many, but you know, the, the levels of innovation and creativity that came with it, along with just community and people like yourselves looking to support others, you know, I think escalated more than, you know, we've, we've seen in, in a very long time. So I really appreciate that story. And you showed off some of your packaging. I believe you got, um, you, you got a few other items to, to show off um, that, you know, Philip and the ARCA team have helped support you with. So if you want to show those off and then I've got a couple questions out of Philip. Yeah, hundred percent. So one thing, you know, uh, going to school as a marketing major, uh, you, you pick up certain things that are, um, I, I think other people might um, not appreciate as much, or maybe they don't put enough emphasis into when they're starting a business. So I know the power behind uh, effective packaging and the customer experience. And it just, it's more of a, a feeling you get when you open something like an Apple, like an iPhone, for example. And, you know, if anyone's cutting corners and not investing into their packaging, they're doing themselves and their companies a huge disservice because, you know, if, if you're looking to cut costs, I highly recommend you find another avenue to cut costs and not packaging. So what we did was traditionally you get a pocket square anywhere you look. This is the presentation of the pocket square. It's this. There's nothing. There's no packaging, there's no boxing, there's nothing, they're loose. They're just hanging up. Some people just have them hanging up in, in like this little circle and you, you snatch it off the rack. And for me, I wanted, you know, I put a lot of time and thought into this. So I, I wanted two things. I wanted it to be giftable. So when somebody receives this, it's a gift. You don't have to go to these means of being like, all right, you know, what, how do I not package this? That was one. And the second is, and I'm not sure if this is a word, but you'll know what I mean. I wanted it to be Instagrammable. So when people see it, they're like, whoa, this is really cool. I want this to be, I, I would take pride in posting this. Uh, and that's honestly how we gain a lot of business is just by having this packaging, right? So we actually, I'll do a little 360, but nice and clean. And again, there's nothing, there's no other product like this um, that's has even remotely close to this, this packaging. And when you get it, it's a gift. So you take it out with some more writing on the back, some tips and perils. And again, we wanted that to be really, really special. And we get such incredible feedback from the packaging. It's especially coming up with the holidays. It's a great stocking stuffer. It's a great add-on gift or it could be the, the main feature. Um, so I have this, what I think to be incredible package for the product itself. The last thing in the world I wanted to do now was skimp out on the, the packaging it would be delivered in because I didn't want to just be another ground box from Amazon that gets lost in the sea of boxes. I wanted to have packaging that when you get it, you get excited. You're like, oh, I want to open this. Like, ooh, this is nice. So I was actually recommended by some other entrepreneurs. I, you know, keep, I, I really, the best thing you can do is, is network with your fellow entrepreneurs and just get ideas. Um, and the name that came, kept coming up several times over was Arca. And I was just like, all right, I've heard enough. I've heard this so many times. They must be onto something. Let me give them a shout. And I did. And I got to say, they made what can be a very complicated, tedious process. Very, very simple. Um, I was very, very pleasantly surprised with how easy it was and how little I had to do. Um, and I even a couple of times I'm like, Hey, is, do you need anything more for me? And they're like, no, we're good. We got you. Like we're, you're good. So they helped kind of, uh, help come up with this concept, which I think is great. So again, I wanted it clean. I wanted it to be not too flashy, not too loud, but something just right in the middle. So we have our box here, right? 
uh, Amit to where we're from, Queens, New York. And then when you open it, I wanted to, again, I wanted there to be pop when you actually opened up the pockets for a gift. So it looks just like so. So we have our, our tagline here, it stays up, kind of incorporated a little humor. And again, we have our pa package right in here. And what's really nice is that you can just pull it right out and it's intact. Uh, when it gets shipped, it didn't bounce all over the place. It didn't mess up. You know, we, we fold it a certain way. We want to keep it intact and having this allows us to do so. And then I asked them, I go, hey guys, what if somebody orders two? Like, then what do we do? Because a big special that we offer and we're doing for the holidays too, we're normally 65 for one, but we're running 99, uh, two for 99 plus free shipping. I go, that's our best promotion. What do we do then? Like, oh, we got you on that too. Like what you do is just have a slot for two. <laughs> so it really just made it very easy for me. And I like working with companies that go that little extra that feel like they're invested into you as an entrepreneur and your business. So, and that's why when, you know, I got uh, this opportunity to be featured here, uh, I didn't even have to think twice about it. And I, I don't, I, I wouldn't be here if I didn't stand behind ARCA and everything they do and, and just making my life a whole lot easier. So thank you guys, Philip, thank you. Thanks, Anthony. It's super nice of you to say and appreciate you showing it off. It looks, that's, that's a sexy box. It looks great. Thank that's that's what we're going for. Thank you. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you said, I mean, it's got that pop. It's got that, that bright yellow and you open it and, um, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to cut that clip and send it over to the Arca team to um, just Absolutely. Sh share share everywhere. But yeah. it's, I mean, a couple items there. One is, you know, you're not the lowest priced option, and you don't want to be because you offer you know the best option out there. And I think so many people focus on, well, how do I trim money to you know so at the bottom, you know, my bottom line is actually in the black, not the red. Where you're like, okay, well, how do I actually increase the average order value? um by focusing on what's important and that that is that unboxing experience it's not just being another commodity product but it's this special experience and you know there's no better example than than apple and you know what they've done i mean how many people have saved their iphone or like mac cases for versus throwing it away the second you get it you know maybe for years afterwards and then you're yeah. like why am i still holding this thing so exactly uh, like that, like you said, that's a gift you wanna you wanna ship out, you know, for the holiday seasons coming up, for for birthdays, for graduations, and whatnot. People getting their first job. That's that's awesome. Uh, and and Phil, like if, if you know if you, I think uh, Anthony explained Arca about as well as you could with visualization. But you know, how would you describe Arca to somebody that hadn't heard of it before? And, and what was the catalyst for you to start it? Sure. Um, plain and simple. You guys have done a great job putting it together uh, on my behalf. But Plain and Simple Arc is a platform for businesses to design and order packaging online. Um, that's the part of the business that helps business owners. And um, for companies like ShipBob, actually what we build is a uh, traceability and transparency integration so that 3PLs can see packages coming and going from production site to facility. But that's a completely different uh, part of the business uh, that doesn't relate to this as much, but it does relate to you guys specifically. Um, that is ship up. Um, what's man. So catalyst for this is I was honestly um, in Anthony's shoes as a part of a team, not for my own company. Um, but I was on the buyer's side either way. And there's so much phone calls, uh, emails, and I, I shit you not, sometimes even faxes that go into getting your packaging where it's a multi-week process to get a quote, uh, sometimes even to get an answer. Um, the tech side of things in the packaging industry is fairly weak, and that's something that I recognized when I was at you know larger corporations like Boeing. Um, from there, I worked at smaller YC-backed startups like iCrack, who got acquired uh, by Allstate about a year, year and change ago. But the um, point I'm trying to drive is whether I was at a huge company or at a smaller startup where you know, I had my own department so I could move as quickly as I wanted to. It was still a pain in the neck. It did not really, it didn't matter. Like the packaging industry is fairly agnostic to who you are unless you have some serious leverage for that specific um, packaging that you're trying to get. And that's not a majority of e-com. Like a majority of e-com is doing less than 5 million a year in bookings. And they don't have the type of sway to go direct to a manufacturer and say, hey, I need this, I need that. Um, when those businesses are typically looking for, you know, a Procter and Gamble or a Kellogg's and some other VC backed packaging companies that might be a little bit more on the tech front and 
sort of run like an agency marketplace model, even those have like pretty high minimum order quantities, like ten tens of thousands just to start with like commitments of like hundreds of thousands of dollars per quarter to even have like a membership, whatever that means. But like with us, we were trying to make this for entrepreneurs. I mean, it's honestly what what gets me excited, what gets the rest of the team excited about what we're actually building. Like we're not just talking to the head of operations at some massive company, like it's, it's other founders. Um, it's other entrepreneurs who want to either have like their side hustle or they're a solopreneur or a mompreneur or they're just bringing in some extra cash doing whatever. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw such a huge influx. Uh, so we're integrated with Shopify and we can see stores turning on and turning off. We'll see if a store shut down versus just simply uninstalled the app. And we saw so many stores turn on that have been dormant for a long time because people are working from home, they're laid off or both. And they wanted to, you know, they wanted to take some sort of ownership for their income. And when it's so easy to just have a few clicks and get their store started with like a big commerce or a Shopify, just a few clicks to get their 3PL set up with someone like a ship bob, like why why can't why can't there be an easier process for packaging? And with Arca, that's our biggest aim to accomplish. Um, it's just to make this like a simpler process and an affordable process. Um, when, when you were stating earlier in terms of not the lowest cost option, that's true when you're looking at custom branded packaging in comparison to not branded packaging. But um, thanks to our technology and how we're moving inefficiencies on the supply chain and production side, we are targeting to be the most affordable when it comes to that specific option of packaging you're looking for, in this case, branded packaging. Um, so we're cognizant of all of that coming from the customer's side of the table and switching to being the provider. Um, you know, there, there's more exciting things coming down the pipeline that I'm that I'm hoping folks stay tuned for. Um, folks like yourself, Anthony, that hopefully can grow with us. Um, and I was to referring it, to Anthony's as products possible. as not the lowest priced option, not not you guys. Oh, got but, it, got it, got it. Um, yes. Yeah, no, they're, they're, that's, that's luxury right there. I mean, you can just yes. see from the packaging itself. And I think, um, as you can see how Anthony is dressed compared to some of us, um, that's, that's what they're going for, right? Um, and in that regard, I think that's totally, um, that's totally sensible and, um, uh, expected, I think when wanting to shop for something like, I mean, even, even the concept of a pocket square is for those who are not, um, you know, being, uh, non-formal, like it's, it's, it's a nice thing to have. And therefore there comes costs with that, but it's worth it when you have such a quality product that comes in such a quality package, I'm going to say. So a question, um, you know, uh, as we, as we talk about so the unboxing experience, as you know, it's, it's close to the 100% open rate as you're ever going to get. And especially with, you know, Facebook CPMs skyrocketing, um, the nothing is better than tapping into the, you know, organic reach from, from people on Instagram and TikTok. You know, Anthony talked about the Instagrammable unboxing Instagrammable. experience. Totally. Uh, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that brands have today about utilizing a solution like Arca, which really can separate you from, from all the noise and the, the tens of millions of other D2C brands that you're competing with? Totally. Um, and shout out to Kevin Marvinick. He's actually one of the first people that I heard say, um, your packaging is the one thing that you send to your customer that has 100% open rate. Um, so fellow member of your team, um, high five to Kevin, um, in terms of things being Instagrammable. Yeah. So a misconception there is some, some folks end up being, uh, penny wise and pound foolish when it comes to their business. This is something that is going to give you a return on your investment. Um, you know, uh, P PWC and, um, actually it was Accenture both came out with um, stats around 60% of consumers wanting to order again because the packaging was nice um, as a consumer. So if you're looking at it in terms of like lifetime value of your of your clients, because that's something you need to take into consideration as well. If you're selling something that maybe I don't know is is cheap and unimportant, maybe maybe you should stick to the brown box. Or if you're based in the states, go to USPS and get boxes for free. We encourage people to just do whatever makes sense for them so that they can grow and get to a point where it's unacceptable to not have branded packaging. Cause at some point it is, it's table stakes. 
no one's going to be sharing the brown box of Cayman. Nobody. Um, so unless you have something that reflects your ethos as a company, whether it's, um, you know, sustainability or the overall aesthetic being a brand pillar that needs to come out in the vessel that actually carried your product because it is it really is a part of the product um so uh, long story short there is just um not giving it a chance and and i think um you know um a shameless plug real quick you can buy samples from us for like 20 bucks fully branded you can buy as few as 10 boxes fully branded just try it out try it out for maybe some folks who you want to get their hands on your product, whether it's like if you if you have access to influencers in your network or just other friends that maybe are popular in social media, whatever the case, nobody nobody's out of reach to help help build your brand. So um, it, it's such a powerful tool to um, evangelize your company. Um, and in that regard, I say pilot it, try it out, um, experiment, and if it doesn't work, Try again when you've got some extra cash in the coffers and do it again. Just iterate. Um, like we were talking about in the beginning of the discussion uh, in terms of early releases of product being an embarrassment to what they are today. Yeah, that's the case with everything. That includes packaging too. Um, so don't think because you struck out on one segment of the product and packaging life cycle that, that's a, that the book on that is closed. You should be failing repeatedly to the top um, as you as you continue to iterate and build build out your product and ultimately your packaging as well. I like that as well. Just with your, you know, even picking a handful of, of influencers or maybe sure. early supporters in the space, it's essentially like a no cost experiment or yeah. thank you gift to you know come up with something custom and, and ship it off. And you know, if you send out twenty items, the chances of one of them being shared in a social set, like you know, on, online. Uh, is, is pretty high and then is, you know these are just some like the no-brainer easy tests to to roll yeah. out and see what that lift is and go from there so I've got a couple more questions before you know we we wrap it up on uh, on today and it's you know we're what is it like I went quick what's up I went back quickly so yeah. we're we're a little over two weeks from uh, we're a little under two weeks over two weeks? Over two weeks from Black Friday. I can do math. Um, do math. Anthony, what's what's on the docket for Black Friday, Cyber Monday? You know, how are you how are you looking to you know separate your brand from from everything else going on uh, for the holidays? So what we want to do is instead of waiting till Black Friday, is just start getting the word out now because yeah especially this year, right? Where yeah. I know so many businesses and uh, startups that, you know, their equipment is on a ship somewhere on the Pacific Ocean. Um, I'm fortunate to have uh, my product here. I ordered a bunch of it earlier in the year. I have our, uh, basically everything we need. We have, our, we have our packaging. So we're in a good position to start getting the word out. So uh, what you have to do is, is in a situation situation like this is, find the leverage. And right now we can offer things that a lot of companies cannot. So instead of waiting and pushing it down the road, um, we're actually telling people now, hey, we, you know, our, our holiday special starts today. You know, the discounts start now as opposed to waiting until really the time of where people are looking to shop earlier, especially with even USPS shipping, local shipping uh, being delayed. I think everything's delayed. Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of people just shopping earlier before Thanksgiving as opposed to years past. So yeah, um, that that's that's the difference this year. Smart. And and Philip, what about you? What are what are some things you're seeing out there across your? You know, you have a really large customer base. What are some of the interesting or innovative ways you see people preparing or or already starting their Black Friday Cyber Monday sales? We've been really pushing on people to start earlier because. Um, you know, uh, the, the paper industry right now is as volatile as it's ever been. Um, I mean, I can go on and on about the stats, but just long story short, there's been four paper increases in the past year. And typically there's like one paper increase every four years. Uh, and due to that, and it's all, all because of like COVID and, and the how huge e-com has become like last year's black Friday, cyber Monday was at 180 plus billion. And this year we're supposed to, and that was the biggest ever. And this year we're supposed we're projected to, to break 200 billion by the end of the year, which is 
just like a mo- that's that's a monster um, of a holiday season that we're going to be having. Um, but in terms of innovative things, um, sustainability is becoming more and more important to consumers, which we really like. And as a B two B to C company, um, we're seeing that on the B two B side and the B two C side. So it's just all the way down um, the the purchasing chain of um, opinions that people have about what they want is becoming more and more eco-friendly. That's why we got our FSC certification. Uh, excuse me. We're also working with you know trying to push more folks towards ship off that has carbon neutral uh, fulfillment, and we're creating our own carbon neutral checkout as well through our partners like EcoCart. Um, just just so people can say that's something that they do. Uh, solely on the fact that it, it drives consumer decision making more and more. I mean, it's at the, and by lowest, I don't mean in terms of tier, I mean in terms of age. It's at the lowest tier of purchases. Like it's really millennial to Gen Z that's caring about this the most. And that that population base is going to continue growing. So um, shout out to everyone who's already doing that, that's coming to ARCA and they're cognizant of it and they're talking to us about it. And to anyone who hasn't gone in that uh, direction yet, um, unless you're, you know, that, that's not your cup of tea and you're, you're totally against uh, having some sort of sustainability aspect uh, to your company, it would be wise to do so. Um, because if you don't, I bet you your competitor will. And then next thing you know, tomorrow, it also becomes table stakes, where if you don't have some sort of component, you're not even going to be considered. Um, so that's, that's something that we're, we're glad to see. I mean, cool. Capitalism can make a lot of good and bad things happen. Uh, this is one of the good things that, that's uh, being driven in the right direction, which is um, just mindfulness on sustainability and eco-friendliness. And, and we're always happy to chat about that when people come our way. Completely agree. I'm glad you called out some of those solutions as well. It, it's it's so easy now for brands to, it's really like this, this little eco-friendly tech stack. You, as you mentioned, yeah. you know, our, uh, our fulfillment network is carbon neutral. We work with uh, Pachama for everything. Yep. Um, once it comes to facilities, we've got Arca on the eco-friendly side for packaging. There's solutions like EcoCard at the checkout solution. And so it's, yep. it's not, it's, it's actually really easy <laughs> to, to unlock yeah. that and tap into, like you said, what will be, and for some brands already is, you know, the, the largest consumer base out there who's growing up really only knowing how to purchase online. So totally. uh, I have a question to to wrap this up that I always ask at the end, Philip, we'll start with you and then Anthony will, uh, you can bring us home. So um, you guys are both well positioned to answer this. What is, uh, Philip, what's your number one piece of advice for entrepreneurs or maybe soon to be founders today? Um, great question. It, it really ties back to this conversation and I'm sorry if I'm stealing this from you, Anthony, but um, just getting it out there, whatever it may be, um, starting as, as soon as possible. And, um, you know, you don't have to burn all bridges to do so. I mean, you, you, Anthony is a great example of that. He's still able to like juggle a nine to five or whatever the hours might be while being able to build like a tremendous company. Right. So, um, there, there's no time like the present. I know it's so cliche. I'm sorry, but it's, it's so true. It doesn't make it any less true at all whatsoever, because the sooner you start, the sooner you'll be iterating and perfecting your product and putting things in the right direction so that you can have like a sustainable, um, sustainable and successful company. I love it. And Anthony, no pressure. Yeah, no, it was a great answer. Um, I would say two, there's two things that come to mind. Uh, one is advice that I was told um, right before launching um, on Kickstarter, and that was be shameless when it comes to self-promoting your business. Because sometimes you're like, ah, oh, am I saying it too much? Uh, am I wearing my rare hat, my rare cut hat too much? Which I pretty much wear when I'm not doing my hair. I wear it all the time. But you know what? Because I'm constantly wearing that, we, we seem to think like, oh, I said it once, everyone remembers. You have to, there has to be a certain amount of repetition before that even registers in someone's mind. That's one. And two, when they actually make a buying decision or ask you about it. So keep pressing, don't, you know, there's not too much. And guess what? If it's too much for someone then and they unfollow you, then you lost someone that probably wasn't gonna be a customer anyways. Totally. You're, you're kind of filtering through who's gonna be a real fan of yours. That's one. And the second I would say is actually, 
we hear a lot of this in you know big name entrepreneurs sometimes will say this or maybe sometimes it'll it'll actually invoke like uh, a certain response in the crowd when people hear it and i say that because i heard someone say it once and i asked him after the speech and he went against what he said uh basically what he had said was if you don't like what you're doing quit today and listen I, is there truth in that you don't want to be miserable life is short yes but if you are trying to start a business it's very expensive it's more expensive than i ever anticipated not um, just financially yeah it, yeah exactly I, I never could have foreseen all the hidden costs and and, if, and now costs are rising for just about everything it's very expensive so for as long as you can if you are in a position to if you could balance between the two do that for as long as you can until you saved up enough money until there's a proof of concept until you have the product out there and until you feel like you're in a good spot um that would be my recommendation that i don't think we hear enough of and i, I really feel strongly about that i love it these are great pieces of advice a great way to end this next time the three of us jump on i'll make sure i, I grow up my uh my beard and so i can match you guys uh we, we can be uh triplets so well, we're so great we it's great you have a great guy and a persian guy i mean it's like it yeah there it, we go it's very easy for us so <laughs> don't really give us too much credit <laughs> all right so uh yeah maybe i won't so all right well i appreciate it everybody who joined us uh i know your time is extremely valuable so thank you for joining us today i learned a lot and definitely from anthony your stories you know very inspiring and you know how you were able to give back as well so thank you both um and we'll see you guys uh next time we run this back take care